It's good to be with you tonight, and to look forward to our study together from 1 Timothy chapter 5. If my memory serves me correctly, I put an if there, I uh, had the privilege of speaking here some 20-something years ago. Brother Billy Helm invited me, and I don't know if it's while I was still in Chattanooga before I went to Morrison, or if it was just when it was, but um, did have to do some looking around before I found the building tonight. It had been that long. And certainly good to be with you. What's our relationship with older members, with younger members? What relationship does widows have with goats? Uh, should we support preach, uh, elders? And why, how do we deal with an elder that falls into sin? Those are some of the questions we're going to be looking at in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 as we get into this. I think basically the uh, lesson is an outline around these questions. And Paul is giving Timothy some instructions regarding relationships in the church. Certainly, we're the family of God. I like that song, God's Family. I saw it. It's in your hymn book. We're part of the family that's been born again, part of a family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. He has saved us, made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And certainly we are a part of God's family. And uh, we're on our way home. As we look at the first couple of verses, He's given some instructions regarding dealing with older members, with younger members. Uh, as I look around, I see a congregation much like Ridgedale, with just a very few exceptions. Most of our members at Ridgedale are 65 and up. Uh, we're an old congregation. We don't have many young people, and, and that's really scary to think about the future of the church. I was over at Morrison, um, I believe that was two weeks ago, to speak on their summer school. There were babies everywhere, young couples, and the future for that congregation is very well set. I grew up in the cotton fields of West Tennessee. Glendale Church Building was surrounded by cotton fields, and every time I go back for a visit, I see a new crop of young people. Um, their future is pretty much set for them. But let's look at these first two verses. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. Now the word elder here is episkopos, from which we get elder, bishop, overseer, shepherd of the flock. But I don't think it's used that way. I think it's a general reference to not rebuking an elder, but entreat him as a father. There may be times when older members need to re be rebuked. Uh, Timothy was told to flee youthful lust, but there are older people that have difficulties in the challenges of life. So rebuke not an elder, but treat them as a father. And then verse 2, the elder women as mothers. Now when he writes to Titus, he gives a lot more instruction regarding uh, older men and older women. Matter of fact, in Titus chapter 2, he talks about the aged men and the aged women. You know, that sounds like someone that's very decrepit. Uh, they're having some difficulty in maneuvering and getting around. But um, uh, there are challenges in life. How do we know uh, when we're in that category. Well, someone has given this definition about age. Old age is when everything hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. The gleam in your eyes from the sunshine on your bifocals. The little black book contains a lot of names, but they all end with MD. Uh, you get winded playing checkers. Uh, you might be old if your children begin to look middle-aged. 
you turn the lights out for economic reasons rather than romantic reasons. Uh, you sit in a rocking chair, but you can't get it to rock. Uh, your knees buckle, but your belt won't. <laughs> uh, the little gray-haired lady you have across the street is your wife. Your back goes out more than you do. And you can really tell you're among the aged if you sink your teeth in a good steak and they stay there. <laughs> you know, that was a lot funnier before I got on the upper side of 75. <laughs> I was talking to John Cup last, last Sunday night, matter of fact, the uh, former sheriff of uh, Hamilton County. And he said, I, these golden years have gotten awfully rusty. <laughs> Uh, he's on a walker. But the aged, uh, we treat them with respect, and they deserve to be treated with respect. Solomon said this in Proverbs 16, 31. Their gray head is a crown of glory. But there's no period right there. Just being gray-headed uh, is no honor. No, If it be found in the way of righteousness. And so... Uh, also, uh, Proverbs 17, 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. How many times you going to see my grandchildren? You going to see my great-grandchildren? We begin to show the pictures. Uh, it's thought that Moses wrote the 90th Psalm. He said the days of our years are three score years and ten, if by reason of strength they be four score Yet it's but labor and sorrow. We're soon cut off. We fly away. And then in verse 12, it says, Teach us to number our days. We had a member when I preached in Florida who said she counted her birthdays with friends. And uh, I don't know if I have uh, that many friends now <laughs> or not, but I hope so. And one other verse from uh, Psalm 92. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God, and they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. And certainly we never get to the point that we retire from the Lord's service. Uh, talking to a preacher friend uh, recently who had just retired and moved back to the Chattanooga area, and he said, I don't know what I was doing. Uh, I think he's got some regrets already about uh, retiring, but he'll probably have enough uh, invites for summer series and other activities that, that he'll stay busy. But he says, rebuke not an elder, and older women treat them as mothers. Then he talks about younger men. I don't know uh, when we move from the point of uh, maybe a youth to middle age to old age. Someone said youth looks back. Old age, old age looks back. Youth looks forward. Middle age looks worried. <laughs> and that might be a, a description for many. But um, we need to treat one another with respect. He said younger men as brethren. Younger sisters with all purity. I don't know where the church would be without ladies. Um, we have uh, most congregations I visit and where I've worked. Uh, women are some of the hardest workers. Over in uh, Romans chapter 16, Paul had a lot to say about women there. Now, I don't know if they're aged or younger, but I would say probably in the middle of what they're doing. Verse 1 of Romans 16. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria. Now, don't ask me what she did. The Bible doesn't tell us. But she was busy in the church at Sancria and considered a servant of the church. That you receive her in the Lord is becoming saints, that you assist her in whatever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a strengthener or a succorer of, of many and of myself also. Paul says, you know, I'm going to hold her up because of her work. 
Then he talks about Priscilla and Aquila. In the next verse, greet them, uh, my helpers in Christ. So she was his helper as well as Paul's helper. And he tells us something about Priscilla and Aquila. Who have, laid, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Then uh, he talks about Mary in verse 6. I don't know which Mary this is. She bestowed much labor on us. Talks about um, uh, Rufus and his mother. So women were very important, and they're still very important. And I don't know where many congregations would be if it wasn't for the women and the work that they do. Well, what about widows and goats. You say, what in the world is that about? Well, in verse 3, honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God, continueth in supplication and prayer night and day. Now, there are some who are widows, and they are desolate. We had a widow, we have a widow, uh, whose husband died, and the children wouldn't help with the funeral expenses. Well, the church picked up the tab for her, her husband's funeral expenses. It's unfortunate that he had been out of fellowship with the church, had been a member at one time. And you wouldn't believe the controversy uh, the elders received regarding uh, helping this widow who's desolate, whose husband is put away, and the bill came due. Well, she had children, but the children are spoken of, I think, in verse 8. And he provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house. He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. And I don't know if they would apply that to themselves or not, but she was a widow who was desolate. Now, we had a lady baptized in a nursing home who was never able to end, attend any service. That was among the last who were buried in pauper cemetery. Uh, we didn't get their information ahead of time, but um, when it came time for the funeral, arrangements had already been made by the funeral home. They have since closed that pauper cemetery, and I don't know what they're doing now, maybe embalming and, and disposing of the ashes. I wish I'd known something I learned shortly after that. Guy working with the what I call the Duck Pond Cemetery, the Chattanooga Memorial Cemetery called me one day. He said, Ken, did you know y'all have eight burial plots in this cemetery? I said, no. Asked around and nobody else knew about it. He said, well, you do have. You can put them up for sale or you can use them. We would have used it for this lady if we had known. I told him, put my name on two of those. And I've since received the deed, but there's, uh, I think there's six others that remain. And if anyone um, in the congregation needs a bear applaud, it's a very beautiful cemetery. It's one of the old ones. I asked God, how does it happen that the church has these burial plots? And he did some research, called me back. He said, well, it seems like when there was a transition in ownership, he thought back in the 1920s. Uh, the owner gave churches in the area uh, so many bear plots. So under that oak tree on the hillside, <laughs> we've got our two spots uh, picked out. I was talking to uh, Brother Greer just the other day. Bill Greer, he has some kind of terminal illness, uh, electro, electro something. But he said he's given his body and made arrangements for it to go to Vanderbilt so that maybe uh, through research they can 
learn more about this particular disease he has. But you say, what about uh, goats and widows? Well, I've got Jim Waldron's newsletter here. And over in India, one way they help widows is to buy goats. Now, goats will eat just about anything. And there are very few uh, compounds that are fenced off. So they buy goats to give a widow, rather than give the person to fish and eat him for a day, teach him how to fish. Well, uh, here's a picture of Brother Waldron. And uh, it was interesting. They tried to find a lorry, a small pickup truck. He said uh, none was available. So J.W. Sampson and I went to the goat market, bought five goats for a widowed sister. Uh, we ended up hiring this auto rickshaw, it's a three-wheel thing, and uh, two preachers, five goats, and one driver <laughs> were in that thing. Uh, I've ridden in all the rickshaws. But uh, rather than just giving her funds that might last for a short while, giving her something where these goats will eat anything. Uh, my grandson has two pygmy goats, and they have cleaned out a fence row that was briars and blackberries, and you wouldn't believe what all. It's clean as a pen now. Uh, Bible has a lot to say about widows. But he says here, if any widow have children or nephew, looking at verse 4, let them learn first to show piety at home. But when they refuse to do that and fail to do that, it comes down to verse 5, that she is a widow indeed and desolate. I found more than 50 references to widows. And God has always had a special place in his heart, I believe, for those who are widows. In Psalm 68, verse 4, just a sampling of some of these verses. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name. Rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a judge of the widows, is God in his holy habitation. Exodus 22, verse 22. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Deuteronomy 10, there's several references in Deuteronomy. I'll just pick this one. The Lord your God is a God of gods, the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible God, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh a reward. He executeth the judgment of the fatherless and the widow, loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. We could go on through, there's some... Uh, about 45 references to widows in the Old Testament, a uh, number of references in the New Testament, such as this here. And uh, by the way, not only is Brother Waldron involved in providing goats and sometimes a cow uh, for widow, here's Brother um, Bontha Usidas, something like that. And uh, his uh, ministry in, in helping widows. And it's a good work, certainly, that they're doing. And uh, there's care that should be given widows. Going back to verse 5. Now she that is widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayer night and day. Uh, she's looking to God for her daily necessities. I have met people in India that said they didn't know where the rice was going to come from for, for their very next meal. I was touching uh, one service. We were sitting up front. It was on a Sunday morning. And when it came time for collection, you hear a coin or two every now and then. Then a person came up with a little tin cup, set it by, they didn't have a communion table, set it by what was the stage. That was her contribution, a cup of rice. And uh, widows, they don't have social security in India or things like that. And uh, 
many of the congregations are made up of the lower caste or the outcast. And they're not even permitted to live in a, in a town if there's a Brahmin there. But um, this way these brethren, through funds provided, are helping take care of those who are widows indeed and desolate. And from time to time, there are widows in this country that need assistance. He talks about the younger widows in verse five, but uh, six. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. He speaks in verse 9 about a widow being taken into the role, uh, pe taken into the number. Did you know the very first problem in the church had to do with widows? In Acts chapter 7, the Grecian, uh, chapter 6, excuse me, in the church at Jerusalem, there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what taken into the number, uh, but it sounds to me like she's put on payroll. Uh, she's given her assistance, and that's on a regular basis because she's desolate, maybe abandoned by her children, but one who doesn't provide for their own is an unbeliever, but this one who meets these qualifications. He gives some very strict qualifications uh, for those who would be taken into the number. Uh, <clears throat> she must be 60 years old. And that was a long life in New Testament days. Uh, verse 9, she has to be the wife of one man. But of course, if she's a widow, that man is not living. Um, uh, she's uh, well reported of good works. Uh, she has brought up children. Maybe they're gone and they've got their uh, struggles. Uh, she's lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, relieved the afflicted, and has diligently, diligently followed every good work. So she's not to be refused. She's to be taken care of. As I said, uh, more than 50 references to widows. James says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the fatherless is this. To visit, not just knock on the door, visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In the afflictions that widows maybe have to go through. But she's not to be taken into the numbers. She's not to be put on the roll um, unless she meets these qualifications. Uh, back in uh, verse 5, she continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. It's been more than 30 years now, but I still remember Sister Kissel, little lady, forget what her nationality was, but said, Brother Willis, I can't come to church, but I pray for you every night before I go to sleep. A widow with the church directory open, she may not be able to do other things, but that is great work. Because the elder said, uh, the apostle says, you choose seven men to look after the widows. We'll give ourselves to the ministry or the work of prayer and the word. And a widow with a church director going down and praying for these people and thinking about them, maybe doing a greater work than those of us who are able-bodied and But she's, verse 10, well reported for good works. She's been busy. She's brought her children up. She's lodged strangers. Uh, she's relieved the afflicted, followed every good work. Then he gives some instructions about younger widows. They don't need the goats. <laughs> they need a husband, he says. 
Verse 11, the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton or turn away against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. Now, for a widow to remarry, he's not condemning just over the board, but those who turn away from Christ. Uh, they've begun to turn away from Christ. And then he's going to say a little later, his advice is for younger widows to marry. Verse 12, it tells us what happens. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers, also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. He says that's the danger of younger widows maybe being put on the roll and having too much time on their hands. And then in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger widows marry. It seems like a condemnation of the younger widows in the previous verses. But I will therefore the younger women younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion of the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. So he says, this is my advice. Sometimes, uh, as Paul writing to the Corinthians, people say, well, he was just an old bachelor, and he's giving his opinion. Well, notice uh, what he says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 34 of uh, chapter 14. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. They are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Uh, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. We're living in a time when one of the Christian colleges, so-called, is training women to preach. Women have already gone out to churches of Christ to preach. Uh, and that's a sad day. If any man, verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. And then Peter comes along and he says, in the third chapter of Second Peter, that some of the things that Paul wrote are hard to be understood. And some twist his words like they do other scripture. Peter said, when Paul wrote, when Paul spoke, it was by inspiration, and it is the commandment of the Lord. So it's not just an old bachelor's opinion when he says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion of the adversary to speak reproachfully. Some had already turned aside from the Lord's work. 16. If any man or woman that believeth hath widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged. But at Jerusalem, the church was taking care of the widows, Grecians and Hebrews. Evidently in other places that was being done. But he said, uh, family first. And when the family can't do it anymore, then the church. Let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Those that are desolate. Those who are truly in need. And then he shifts to elders. And I think the word elders in verse 17, while it's like the word elder in verse 1 I think it's speaking of the overseers in the church let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they that labor in word and doctrine um, in Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 is a verse that's referred to in the New Testament a number of times 
That verse has to do with uh, muzzling the ox that's treading out the corn. It deserves to eat some as it's going around in circles. There's a boy with some sorghum mills in our community. And that old mill going round and round, the cane being fed and getting the uh, uh, sorghum or the juice from that. In 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about the labor is worthy of his hire. Luke chapter 10, verse 7, the labor is worthy of his hire. So when he says, uh, let the elders that rule well be kind of worthy of double honor, I think the double honor includes their looking after the flock, their preaching and teaching the flock, and being paid for the service they rendered. The uh, church I served in Florida had a man that uh, his Social Security was being supplemented. He was an elder. Uh, but bless his heart, uh, he would go visit somebody in the hospital. They said, now, Brother Jim, it's getting toward dark. It's time to go home. Uh, preacher had to go to the public library to get his studying done because of Brother Jim. But um, we have two preachers in Chattanooga. We have three elders. Two of those are preaching elders and paid elders, you might say. I don't know what the situation is here, but uh, they that labor are worthy of their hire. And then he refers to that scripture in Deuteronomy 24. Uh, the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The labor is worthy of his reward. So it's scriptural to be an elder. And then regarding charges that are brought. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Got to establish the fact that... Um, there's a violation of scripture. Got to establish the fact that it's reliable information and then that can be dealt with. Elders have made mistakes. Elders have fallen into sin. Others have uh, succumbed to temptation. But receive not an accusation. I think one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with in church work including 50-something years, is that next verse. Don't receive an accusation against an elder, them to sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. Information came to me through a phone call that one of our two elders, one was on vacation out in Missouri somewhere. It was in Florida. Accusation came against an elder that he had been having sexual relations with a young lady in the congregation. She was, uh, I suppose, mentally challenged and he had taken advantage. I said, are you sure about that? That's a serious charge you're making. Well, she told this one, and this one, and this one. And I called that elder who was on extended vacation and I said, you know, what do we do? He said, my advice is you call the deacons together. Y'all have a meeting with him to establish whether or not he owns up to it. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not there, but you'll just have to deal with it. Well, we called him in, said there's going to be a special business meeting at church. You need to be there. It concerns you. And uh, he denied it. The girl was there, her parents were there, but he denied it. Before Sunday, I don't remember what day of the week, seemed like it was a Tuesday. Before Sunday, one deacon called me and he said, you know what being said at work? That this girl's going to have an abortion, the church met to pay for it. And I called this man back. I said, now, it's causing trouble in the church. He said, well, I just couldn't admit it, but I'm guilty. And so he had to be rebuked before the congregation as one in sin. And uh, that terminated the eldership for a period of time. But I go on to say that it is 
wife finally forgave him, and they lived many years together. He did many, well, mission trips to Russia, mission trips to other areas. But uh, against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Sometimes uh, people want to bend the preacher, <laughs> and they want to give him an inside scoop, but no, needs to be before witnesses. And them the sin rebuke before all that others may fear. And then with verse 21 through the remainder of the chapter, there are some serious charges that are given. Did I hear a bell ring? One? Or that that have been two? <laughs> okay. Very quickly. Uh, notice the seriousness of this charge that's given to me. Before God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, before the elect angels, don't show partiality, Timothy. Uh, don't show preferring one. Now, don't ask me who these elect angels are. I don't know, but they were special category of elders, uh, of angels. Uh, lay hands suddenly on no man that cares with the idea of ordination, ordaining elders. And, uh, quickly get involved in that. But keep yourself pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. And treat younger sisters with all purity, he said in verse 2. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be protector of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And then a um, prescription. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, thine often infirmities. Nothing in this to endorse social drinking. Uh, medicinal purposes. One of the um, uh, men who visited that part of Ephesus said the water was very impure. And maybe Timothy was having some difficulties. You don't have to drink the water to get in trouble. On one of our trips to India, brush my teeth without thinking, rinse my toothbrush out under the towel. Everything fine that day. Next day when I brush my teeth, heard of Montezuma's revenge 10 days. It's a rough way to lose weight. But uh, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake than often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. Some men they follow after. Um, and writing to the Corinthians, they talk about vessels of clay and vessels of gold, and vessels of silver. He says, you know, we're, we'll be rewarded, some in this life, others beyond this life. Last verse, likewise also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand. They're obvious, they're seen. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. They may think they're getting away with it, may think they're hiding their uh, bad deeds, but it can't be hid. So uh, we're part of the family. In God's family, uh, tensions arise, and uh, sometimes conflicts arise. But Paul gives inspired instruction how to deal with conflicts. Invitation now, or something. We've been looking at more of a study regarding relationships in the church. We start out with that song, God's Family. And one of the greatest blessings in life to be a part of God's family. To know that whatever happens in life, we're in his hands. And we have the promises that we can claim, such as Romans 8, all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Not a guarantee that it'd be a bed of roses when we become a child of God. I've had people down through the years said, I thought all my problems were going to be over when I obeyed the gospel, but I'm still having temptations. I'm still having problems. Well, maybe they didn't make a clean break or didn't completely repent. Uh, they had the wrong idea. But God will help us. 
I read the book of Revelation. I see about those trials and temptations and persecutions and atrocities that were leveled out against the church. But God said, Be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee the crown of life. One day you'll be out of this body of clay. Farther along, we'll understand why, as that song indicates. So tonight, if you're not a member of the Lord's family, you can be a part of God's family. That's been born again. That's experienced the new birth that Christ spoke to Nicodemus about and speaks that is required of all. When you'll repent of your sins, when you'll confess the name of Christ and be baptized into him, your sins will be washed away. You'll then be in God's family. And by remaining faithful to death, one day heaven will be your home. If we can assist you in any way, let it be known as we